So, uh, the first experiment on this side of the room is going to be Archimedes' principle. So, the story behind Archimedes was that he was asked by the king to figure out whether or not he was getting ripped off because he had a crown full of gold and he wanted to know whether or not it was real gold because at the time he had suspected that such and such used silver, supposedly. Uh, I don't know. Feel free to look up the story and write it in your background. I probably won't read it. Um, but it's an interesting story. But anyway, there's a different way to find the densities of objects, um, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to explore two different ways to find the density of three different objects. So each of you have three different objects on your table, which should be a composition of maybe like two cylinders and a cube, or two cubes and a cylinder, but they should be varying compositions because it works best if they're varying densities because getting the same answer over again is boring. Um, so we're going to find the density of three different objects. The first step is to find the mass in air. So what do I want to do? I want a straightforward procedure. First thing I want to do is to take the scale off the perch and set it on the table. Find the mass of the object using the triple beam balance. Once you find the mass on the table, okay, go ahead and suspend it back up onto the perch and find the mass again. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I want agreement between what the mass says it is on the table and what it says it is on the perch. All right? The reason being is because when you put them on the perches, sometimes the balance doesn't necessarily sit level. All right? So if it's not level, because remember it's a triple beam balance, if it's not level, there's most of these have a little piece of tape on them, um, adjust the piece of tape to where level is, and you'll know that that's your zero point. Okay? Um, once you've done that, Take your rubber band and tie up the object like so, and check one last time to make sure that you have an agreed upon mass. Now, the mass should be a little bit heavier when it's suspended because the string and the um, rubber band are going to have a small mass, but it should not have much of an effect. It should be less than a gram. Um, feel free to account for it or not. I'll leave that up to you. So, once you have... Um, found the mass in air and labeled it M air, you're going to then find the mass submerged. So you take the object and you're going to put it in water. A um, couple of key factors. Number one, make sure that the object doesn't touch the sides of the container. It has an effect. If you want me to explain that, I will as I'm walking around the room. Um, the other thing is uh, make sure the object doesn't touch the side of the container and also make sure that it's completely submerged. All right, so for this to work, the object has to be completely under and what will happen is when you submerge it in water, there'll be a buoyant force upward on the object, just like there is on you when you're swimming. The buoyant force is going to make it appear like the mass goes down, okay? But as a theorist, I have to explain to you guys that it's, do not write that the mass decreases. I mean, you can, and I'll probably let it slide, but for the sake of my sanity, please don't write that the mass goes down. Mass is an intrinsic property of an object. It doesn't go down. A lot of students get confused because they equate mass and weight, all right, and those are two different things. Your weight is a mass times an acceleration, right? Mass, so basically what's happening is when you step on a scale, it's measuring a force. Pounds is, a, is, a, is analogous to a force, all right? When you take a reading on this scale and it gives you a mass, it's because it's taking the force and it's divided by 9.8, all right? So what it's doing is it's measuring some Newton and it's divided by 9.8 to give you the mass of gram. So yeah, the whole point to that is don't write that the mass goes down, but you can write that it appears that the mass goes down. All right, because there might be a bonus question at the end of the year, who knows. But uh, yeah, so once you have the mass submerged, which should be less than the mass in air, it will be less, uh, plug into this equation. So m air divided by the difference between the mass in air minus the mass submerged, and multiply that by the density of the fluid it's submerged in. Okay, this is a re-derivation of Archimedes' principle. And the density of fluid, which we call rho, is one gram per cubic centimeter. So you don't actually have to put anything in, it's just one, but understand that your <coughs> units are grams per cubic centimeter. All right, so once you've done that, you're gonna find the density a second way, and the way you're gonna do that is you have the mass in air, which you've already obtained. You'll have that value. You'll then find the volume of your object by measuring the dimensions. So for a cube, you're going to measure side by side by side, multiply those three values together. Be careful with some of the cubes because they do not have equal sides. So I would tell you multiply side cubed, 
but some of them have varying sides a little bit different. Uh, quick note on taking a measurement and being objective. All right, one of the methods that I like to teach students, um, I don't know if it's proper or not, but I know it makes more sense, um, is to take a measurement, if I were to take a measurement of an object on your table, and I were then to hand it off to another student and say, here, does this look like uh, 2.5 centimeters? You would look at it and go, yes, it does. Um, I have biased your observation by already giving you my observation. All right, so what I like to have students do is to gauge some sort of uncertainty or to make sure that it's objective, is have one student measure and then have another student measure. And once you both have the values, simultaneously tell yourselves the values, okay? That way, if you disagree, there won't be any sort of bias. You understand this, right? Because if I go across and I tell you what I think it is, you're gonna look at it and go, eh, I guess it is 2.5. But if you were to take your objective measurement, you would, uh, you would come up with something possibly novel. All right, so measure the sides of the cube, <coughs> multiply those together to get the uh, volume of a cube. Volume of a cylinder is pi times the radius squared times the length of the cylinder, and you'll get the volume that way. And then now, you'll do a percent difference. So for those of you who have been writing percent difference in your lab reports, this is the part where you actually realize that percent difference is not percent error. All right, percent error is when you're comparing two things, one of which is the accepted value, which we'll do over here for the most part. Percent difference is when you're comparing two things that require experimental values. And in this case, both of our two measurements will require <coughs> experimental values. This requires measurements, this requires measurements. So we don't ask the question, how close is it to the accepted value? We're asking the question, how closely do my two experimental values agree with each other? Okay, because that can be, that can be answered. So you do the percent difference and calculate that. Should be less than 10% for the most part on most of them. And my bonus question is, how would this experiment change if I increase the temperature in the room? All right, so think about what happens to objects and what happens to fluid and all these different things. Um, look them up. You can always ask me questions about my bonus questions and I might point you in the right direction. I'm certainly not going to give you the answer, but I can help you out with it. So, okay, so that's it for that experiment. All right. So the second experiment is a uniform circular motion. So we're going to use a rotational device, as you can see on the table, um, to calculate the laws of rotational motion. Um, have you guys caught up to this in lecture yet? No? We haven't talked about rotational motion at all? We yeah. have. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if people should be right now. It's hilarious. For those of you awake, have you caught up to this in lecture yet? I get it. It's that. I'm going to edit that. Uh, find the mass of the bob first step. Okay, so the first step is disconnect this uh, bob right here, which is just this metal part, and find the mass on one of the floating triple beam balances around the room. Um, once you've done that, all right, reconnect it just like you see it, all right? Now, one key point of this experiment is that you have to overcome the spring force to get this object to stretch out. So what I'm going to do is, you can see how it's pulled inward by the spring at this point, all right? I'm gonna spin this object, and as I spin it, it's going to create a centripetal acceleration that gets it to move outward, all right? So, you have to make sure that this spring is tight enough, and if it's not tight enough, you have to disconnect the spring and screw it in. I'll help you if you need help as you're going through it. So you're gonna pick uh, two radial values that we're gonna test, and you're gonna mark this piece of paper accordingly to those two radial values. So these radial values are the numbers on the apparatus. So you can see it says 14 through 22, all right? That is the distance in centimeters to the center of the rotation, okay? So that's giving you the value of R. You just have to write down which values you choose. The next step is to take a piece of tape and tape a piece of paper at that given radius. Now, this is the key point that's really important, all right? When you tape the piece of paper, you want to make sure that you tape it in such a way that only the tip of the cone is able to flick the piece of paper, all right? So if you make the piece of paper too high, you're going to flick other parts of the cone, and as a result, you're going to get values that you don't, uh, that don't agree with the, with the experimental method. So I can explain that as I'm walking around. Basically, you're going to flick other parts of the cone, and you won't be at the radius you think you're at. All right, so your calculations won't line up. All right, the next step is zero out your stopwatch. Assuming you know how to use a stopwatch. Somebody messed this up. There we go. All 
All right, so I'll start to spin the apparatus, and as I spin the apparatus, the bob is going to move outward. It feels a centripetal acceleration, which is inward toward the center, which means it feels a fictitious force, centrifugal acceleration, outward. Okay? Think about it in terms of your car. If you accelerate forward, you feel a force backwards. All right? Well, that's why sometimes confusing the students, the centripetal acceleration is inward toward the center. So as I spin it, I'm going to get it outside of that radius, and then I'm going to let it degrade, and I'm going to listen for the number of flicks. All right? Once I hear flicks, I'm going to time five revolutions with a stopwatch. All right? So watch me. Okay, so I timed five full revolutions, all right? Now I'm gonna tell you something that might be a little bit uh, comical. The hardest part of this lab for most students is they have trouble counting to five, all right? Now, when I say that, I really mean it. One of the non-intuitive things you think is that you think that you're gonna start the stopwatch on a flick, and a lot of students will count one the minute they start the stopwatch, all right? You're counting the number of revolutions, so it's important. Once you start the stopwatch, you count one on the next consecutive flick. All right, so if you get like a 20, 30% error, odds are that you counted four revolutions and not five. All right, so remember. Is it outside or inside? One, two, three, four, five. 3.52, so that was consistent both times. All right, so once you measure the total time for five revolutions, you take that time, T, and divide it by five to get tau, all right? Um, just a note on taking the time, make sure to take about at least three different trials for each of the two radius to make sure that your times that you're getting are consistent, okay? Um, take the average of those values. Once you find the average, divide that by five to get tau, which is the period of rotation. Then you calculate omega, which is the angular frequency, by taking two pi and dividing by tau. And then from there, you plug into this equation with your radius in meters, and squaring your omega value will give you the centripetal acceleration value, okay? You then can take this equation and find the applied force. So the next step in the process is you disconnect the string and you grab the hanger, and you suspend the hanger over the side like so, and now, spinning the object created a force to get it out to a certain distance. The next thing we're gonna figure out is what kind of force we need by applied force to get it out to that distance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add mass to the hanger and I'll continuously add mass until I can stretch it out to the given radius that I had chosen, all right? And whatever mass you find to get it out to that radius is the mass required for the applied force. So, you take this equation, M hanger, and multiply it by G, gravity, and you'll get the applied force. Remember, the hanger weighs 50 grams by itself. And then the final step is to take the applied force and divide it by the centripetal acceleration. So you take this value and divide it by this value, and you'll get what you should find is that you get the mass of the bob. All right? So you compare what you get here to the measured mass of the bob from the beginning. All right? And that's a percent error. Uh, once you've done that, then move on and calculate the second radius. So you're doing two different radius. Um, tip, choose the inner radial values, all right? Don't pick anything above 19, all right? Because the more, the higher radius you find, the more you have to cook this thing to get it out to that distance, the less time it stays at that radius, and also the faster you have to time it, all right? So to make it easy on yourself, just a pro tip, do less than 19 for both of your radial values. Uh, bonus question, how would this experiment change in the center of a merry-go-round? So I want to ask the question, if I were to put this at the center of a merry-go-round and spin it, how would it change? And I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Okay, so watch closely. Spin the merry-go-round. All right, that's the only hint you're going to get. Feel free to do it yourself, just don't drop anything on your foot. Um, yeah, the other thing too, guys, with my bonus questions, Make sure you are, if I ask how would the experiment change, you can't just simply tell me what's different with the experiment. I'm asking explicitly how would the experiment change, all right? So you saw, a lot of you said, well, you know, in the elevator, the, the weight of the objects goes up, which is true, technically speaking, but you didn't tell me how it changed the experiment, all right? So when I ask these questions, I'm asking 
how does the experiment affect you? Okay, uh, that's it. We get started.